Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Everything You Need to Know About Your Employee Handbook, presented by our sponsor, Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Michelle Wilcox and I will be your moderator today and I will also be moderating questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discussed can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We don't control the audio devices, your, your devices control the audio. So if you have difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes down and dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, uh, I'm sorry, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative calling number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or questions during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we completely run out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout, and the, present, the presenter will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of upcoming webinars covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan Web webinar website. It's always a tongue twister for me. In addition, we are offering the mandatory preventive sexual harassment training in English on June 11th this year. With that, let's begin today's webinar. Our presenter today is Diana Cano. Diana has over 20 years of professional human resources experience. Diana is a subject matter expert in the full spectrum of human resources management, Diana has held progressively responsible positions with the public sector, special district, and private sector employers. Diana has notable experience in strategic human resources planning, performance management, staffing, succession planning, employment law compliance, employment contract negotiations, employee benefits, compensation and payroll, training and development, and human resources coaching slash mentoring. In 2021, Diana decided to start her own human resources consulting business, where she has been able to deliver human resources solutions and a wide range of human resources policies and procedures, documents and recruiting activities to various businesses. Diana looks forward to using her HR expertise in assisting the webinar attendees today. With that, thank you again, Diana, for being with us. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to you at this point. All right, thank you, Michelle. Um, I I'm happy to be here this morning. Um, we're here to discuss, uh, let me show my screen. We're gonna discuss today um, the employee handbook, um, the do's and the don'ts, um, pretty much what should be included in a handbook, what should not be included in the handbook. The information that I'm gonna be presenting is general in nature, um, it, it, and it's intended to just present an overview of employment practices. The written and the verbal contents of the presentation are not intended to constitute consulting and or advice, and no client relationship is established um, between um, myself and, and all of you as attendees. So that's just a, a legal disclaimer that we, we need to provide. As Michelle mentioned, I do have quite a bit of a background in human resources. I did actually form my company in 2021. I am a graduate of California State University Fresno many years ago. And I've actually um, done the majority of my human resources work in private sector with the last five years in um, private sector. So I'm actually uh, really happy to provide you um, information on the handbook um, throughout my years as a professional. Um, this is one of those items that, that, that I took charge of on an annual basis. And now as a consultant, I definitely have been working with a lot of companies and ensuring that they have a good handbook. So the object objectives today is to review what an employee handbook is, um, to provide you with some um, key handbook uh, policies. It will, we'll also discuss a little bit about the location of the employees, as well as the documentation and training that's required for the handbook. So 
So uh, just a little bit of information here. Here's one of the statistics. Did you know that according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, that the average absence rate of full-time wage and salaried workers is roughly three absences per year? This does not include any vacation or personal time. So as you all know, employee absenteeism can hurt your organization. So it's essential that you resolve it as soon as it occurs. One of the things that your employee handbook should provide is um, a clear expectation and clarification on what course of action you will take should there be an absenteeism problem. Another did you know? Did you know that bad behaviors in a workplace decrease productivity, they hurt morale, and may also cost the company business? So whether you're dealing with a minor problem such as chronic lateness or something major like falsifying financial reports, obviously prompt attention to this issue is key. But the other thing an employee handbook will do and should do is establish a standard for behavior and also set expectations for employees um, to follow. So that when someone ignores those standards, that you as the employer are able to fo follow up with a course of action of following a strict discipline procedure to help correct the situation. Okay, we're gonna start with our first polling question. So the question is, do you have an employee handbook or written policies? Employee handbook, written policies, or nothing in writing. So we're gonna wait a few minutes until we get majority of people that have entered or posted their responses. And let's see here, we got about 80% vote. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, looks like 89% have employee handbooks and 54% have written policies and five have nothing in writing. That's actually a really good uh, turnout. So most of you know, um, since most the majority of you have a handbook, that the handbooks are helpful. They are a good source of reference um, for company policies, as well as the legal requirements. Um, what also should be contained in your handbook is anything that has to do with state and federal labor laws. Um, one of the things that some people do include in their handbooks, but it really gets confusing when you include these things are some of the operational details. So anything that has to do with a step-by-step -step process for such example would be like an expense reimbursement or what a supervisor does with a time off request. Those sort, those items are operational and generally in nature, they have a tendency to um, change over time. Um, those items would specifically not be contained in your handbook. Um, the other thing a handbook does is it helps you establish what your company culture and communicate what your company values are. So some of the operation, there, there's various different kinds of resources that employees could could use and, and, and me being in the workforce, I actually had all of these. Um, so I did have an operations manual. So an operations manual is basically similar to the example that we gave previously. It discusses your day-to-day -day processes and procedures. So how to process a reimbursement request, what is the process for submitting a time off request? So that would be considered an operations manual if you have a large organization or a large number of employees, it's definitely something you should consider to have in addition to your employee handbook. Um, a supervisor's manual is basically like a to-do. It's, it's a guideline for supervisors to use to help them within their role as a supervisor. So most companies, as employees get promoted into the supervisory role, um, they not employers not only provide them the required training that they have to have for sexual prevention of sexual harassment, in anti-bullying, but they generally will go over some of the responsibilities a supervisor should have. So if you want to put those processes in a in a written format, you would have a supervisor's manual in addition to an employee handbook. Um, but one of the, the specific items that an employee handbook um, will contain is basically a reference for employees 
um, to, to look at specific things such as the code of conduct, their hours of work, the attendance policy, dress code policy, the requirements for breaks and meal periods, um, technology use, drug use, smoking. So they're very specific um, standards, uh, whether they're legal or not, that a company, regardless of the change in staff of the operation, um, the rules or policies or laws would not change. Okay, let's get into our second polling question. Have you trained managers on your harassment policy? Yes, no, or we don't have a policy. And we're gonna give it a couple minutes here and it looks like everybody's quick on the trigger. So we appreciate everybody's participation in this. It really helps and makes it a little more exciting. So we have, let's see here, we've got 70, percent say yes, 20 no, and 10 we don't have a policy. That's pretty uh, middle of the ground. I think that's pretty common too. I always suggest that a good time to go over an employee manual is during the orientation process. Um, not so much on the onboarding period because you have to get that done pretty quickly, but definitely within the first week or so of a new employee, it's always good to kind of go through the parameters of the employee handbook. Make sure that your managers um, have that understanding when they have employees that show up at their department, that that's a really good thing to do within that first week. Um, most managers are anxious to get them on the floor or on the desk to get started with tasks and duties, but it's always good for the employer to, to review that handbook and make sure that there's an understanding of what the expectations are aside from the uh, performance of their duties and responsibilities. So some of the things and the reason why it's important to go through the handbook right away is it does explain what constitutes as harassment and quid pro, quid pro quo. It also confirms the policy is circulated. It's also under, and that it's understood. It trains your managers on what to do and what to say during certain situations. Um, even though investigations are to be conducted under certain allegations of harassment, um, it should have the language in your harassment policy that doesn't promise an immediate investigation, but a timely investigation. That is what the employer is required to do. The harassment policy contained in the handbook should also provide examples, examples of what constitutes as potentially harassment or um, discrimination should, should also be contained in, in your harassment policy. And then we wanna make sure that um, there is something in there that employees understand and know that they should always feel safe about discussing any allegations of harassment and or bullying claims. The harassment policy also should outline a procedure for reporting and addressing. What, how do you go about reporting and what is the employer going to do to address it? Um, it should also inform the employee of who's going to manage the claim, um, who, you know, um, some of the choices for the contacts and who they would be contacting, um, some of the written or verbal options that an employee has in order for them to bring forward an attention or attention of allegations of harassment. And then some of the outside resources that are available to them, um, such, such as DFEH or Department of Fair Employment and Housing um, would be an example of an outside resource. And then the policy ultimately should, should conclude with a discussion of disciplinary consequences should any of the allegations um, be true, either in whole or in part. Another policy that your employee handbook is, uh, it's important for your employee handbook to contain is the, the drug and alcohol policy. Um, drug and alcohol policy definitely should always in, make a statement that there's zero, zero tolerance at the site of the, employee, the employer. So the, the employer should be committed to providing a safe and quality oriented and productive work environment um, for themselves and for all employees who work there, as well as the, the public who comes to your property. There should be something um, in there about uh, prescription use and, and um, as a safety issue, 
Um, basically, the policy should include that that even if you're un, on a prescription medication, you must be able to work safely um, while you're on this prescribed medication. It should address marijuana, CBD use um, in your drug policy, and as well as a clause about testing, reasons for testing, and then if uh, the results are positive, what the consequences or what, the, what avenue the employer would take. Okay, heading into our next polling question. Do you have a policy stating employees have no expectation of privacy? Yes or no? So we're going to give it a few seconds here. I usually like to wait until there's about 70, 75% voted so that we don't miss anybody that might just be slow to respond. Okay, so looks like a majority say that they don't have a policy. 61% says no, 39 says yes. Okay. Um, yeah, there, you definitely want to go back to your handbook for those of you that don't have a policy. It's really important, and maybe you do have it, you're just not aware that it's contained in there. But it's really important for employees to understand that there they have there should be no expectation of privacy. Um, understanding that they're using compu the company computer, phones, portable electronic devices, and other communication tools, they're using it on behalf of the company, and so therefore the company has every right to inspect or to to um, retrieve any of those items and to take a look at what's what communication is actually taking place. So specifically when you're sending um, personal emails or using the internet on a company computer, all of that is subject to um, no privacy for the employee. So it also should be, um, there should also be a clause in your, um, communications policy, and this is specifically addressing the electronic communication. So anything that has to do with computers, um, cell phones, telephones, um, aside from saying that employees um, do not have any expectation of privacy, there also, sh there, there needs to be a clause that says um, that, that we're going, it's not to avoid any kind of concerted effort. And, and what that means specifically with respect to concerted effort is um, specifically about their employees' ability to um, discuss um, any kinds of uh, terms or conditions of employment, um, pay, things like that. He has a right to discuss those things. So it usually has to do with um, wages, working conditions, benefits, all those things. Um, the employees do have the right to engage in um, some of those activities and using electronic communications for solely that purpose is, is an acceptable uh, method. So we want to make sure that whatever policy we come up with, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't um, negate their ability to use it for that. So there's, there's a legal clause that's normally written within um, a policy. Um, that talks about the no expectation of, and then also the concerted effort. And then it is okay to have rules about online activity. So we, we want to make sure that they're not too rigid. So if we're posting things on social media, you know, we want to make sure that, that they're not rigid to the point where during their work hours, they're not able to get on them. So I always advise during off time, lunch break, regular rest periods, um, you know, those those things should be acceptable. But you could definitely say, you know, while you're on the clock or while you're getting paid during the hours of whatever their operating hours are, that that you they're not permitted to be on their personal phones or exercise these kinds of thing, um, equipment during those times. Um, we do want to consider personal privacy versus the company concerns. And so you know, GPS on vehicles, phones, um, tight keeping applications, 
Um, we we want to make sure that there's something in there that talks about that. And then um, something that also includes rules for remote workers. So what kind of online security do they have? And then also the use of personal. I think we talked a little bit about that, using your personal phone versus company cell phones. So you want to make sure that your handbook contains all of the do's and don'ts with respect to electronic communications. And, and that would be specific to computers, internet, email, and, and other resources. Okay, let's get into another polling question. What type of disciplinary procedure do you have? Discretionary, progressive, or don't know the difference? Give it a couple more minutes here, or seconds, I should say. Okay, we've got about 70% in, so we've got 27% discretionary, 30%, I'm sorry, 37% progressive, and 36 don't know the difference. That's an interesting polling result there. So um, yeah, so the handbook definitely should have a disciplinary policy. I always say, you know, whatever's contained in the handbook, make sure you're consistent with how that's applied out in the workforce. So we do want to include specific language in our disciplinary process. Um, one of the languages always should say state um, the phrase include but not limited to. So I always say, you know, you wouldn't put that you know, com comment in maybe a counseling memo if a counseling interaction is not considered to be disciplined. If it's just a counseling or you're just writing up to fault to to document a counseling session, if it was verbal but wasn't intended to be disciplined, then you would not use that language. Um, but the very first and lowest level of discipline um, usually is some kind of a formal written reprimand. You definitely want to include that language because it should be understood that that document is actually discipline in nature and further acts or similar acts if they continue um, would include further discipline up to um, but not limited to and, the, and it would be limited to termination. Um, it's generally used specifically when you're using um, progressive discipline as your um, motive, um, if, if that's what you, your company it, it wants to adhere to. We also want to use uh, comments like violation may lead up to disciplinary action up to and including termination. So you always definitely want to say that even if it's just a warning um, we want to um, we want to say that further violation of this action will lead up to or may lead up to I'm sorry um, to, up to and including termination. Um, we don't want to be overly detailed about the disciplinary procedure, so that might go to some of the those people who aren't sure about um, if they use discretionary or progressive. Um, we we definitely as an employer want to make understand you know are we taking progressive disciplinary or would it just be at the discretion of the company and so we just want to be consistent with the language in the handbook as well as um, what we communicate to our employees um, most companies um, do provide for some kind of progressive discipline so generally speaking a, a disciplinary situation would start with a verbal warning the next level would be some kind of formal written reprimand. And then the last section, you know, back in the day, there used to be an exercise for suspending employees, um, but most of the time people go right into termination. So that would be considered a progressive discipline. Um, and of course, everything should be, um, you know, based on whatever the action is of the employee. Um, another thing that um, a handbook should contain are whatever your policies are with respect to time off. So there's various times of time off um, for companies. Some have paid time off, some have unpaid, um, some have vacation, personal time, um, personal holidays. So whatever it is that your company has, you wanna make sure that one, it's legal to provide in your particular state but then also be consistent with um, in terms of how you 
apply um, those kinds of, uh, or what those practices or what those policies are with respect to time off. Um, you also want to make sure that your time off policies include the different types of leaves of absences, especially um, if FMLA or CFRA applies. The handbook would also con um, contain um, probationary period. Some people use the term introductory period. So you wanna make sure that you understand what this does and doesn't do. So what happens after their probationary period? If it's most companies have a 90 day probationary period, well, what happens after that 90 days? So you wanna make sure that this is also communicated and it's also supported by the, a written paragraph within your handbook to get a better understanding of what that probation period entails. You also want to include that the time may be extended. Um, I, I say this because sometimes there are certain situations, especially with employees that you know newly get hired, um, maybe they accept a position but you and you allow them to come into your workplace, but they have a pre-approved um, two week or three week vacation out of the country that was already scheduled. So you may or may not want to extend their probationary period for that set amount of time since they're not at the office to be evaluated. So you do want to put in language that it may be extended. Um, and that's just one of the reasons there might be other reasons why you want it to be extended. Maybe a person got promoted and they're supposed to obtain a particular license within that three three month period of time. Maybe it's a class A driver's license, but due to circumstances at DMV or whatever the case may be, they're not able to get their license by that three month period of time. So you might want to extend it for an additional period of time. So there's various reasons and various situations that you may want to do that, um, but you just wanna make sure that the language is in there um, to, to help if you, if as the employer, if that's what you want to do. And then you wanna make sure that if you do have a clause about your probationary period, that you don't say that you're gonna follow up at the end of the probationary period if you're not going to do that. So understand what the practice is. Most employees get some kind of a review um, about the end of their probationary period so that they understand that they're you know, permanent employees at that point or what, you know, if there's duties and responsibilities that change now that they are past probation, um, maybe there's benefits that they're now entitled to. So if most of the time clauses will say that they will follow up with the employee at the end of the probationary period. So you just want to make sure that you do that if that's what your paragraph says. Okay, moving on to the next question. How does your handbook explain, or I'm sorry, does your handbook explain when they are paid? Yes, no, or you're not sure what that means. And just quickly, we did have a question. Somebody had asked, what is the difference between progressive and discretionary? While we're waiting, you might be able to address that, Diana. Yeah, so usually in an employee handbook, uh, it will show what the progressive disciplinary actions um, that an employer will take. So if it's progressive, it will say um, counseling memo and it or verbal warning and it'll describe what verbal warning is. And then it goes into counseling, goes into written, it'll, it'll show the progression and then it has a description of every single one. If it's discretion, that means that it's up to, uh, maybe it's a, the CEO who has the discretionary authority to determine discipline. Some companies, there is no disciplinary action, if you will. I mean, they may be verbally warned, but they're also at the time that they're verbally warned, let, they're also informed that should that behavior exist or happen again, that they're gonna be terminated. There is no in-between. Um, it's it's a, the general authority, generally speaking, of a general manager or a CEO, generally speaking, in private sector employers, that a, that a general manager may say, I'm not gonna deal with discipline if their conduct is such that it's not in line with the company core mission or values or whatever it is, then they're gonna be immediately dismissed. And so you would wanna make sure that there's a clause in there that says, should there be any action or violation of our policy or employee handbook that you will be, um, 
um, you will be disciplined at the discretion of the general manager. And then he, you basically, as a supervisor, manager, HR, however you're organizationally set up, it would just be taken to that individual. That person would decide what course of action that employee will, will have. Great. The problems with that, generally speaking, is it opens itself up for inconsistency. And it also opens itself up for problems if you have a change in management. So if you have a change in who that person is that's making those decisions, it could, if you have you know, a period of time where employees have been there for a while, it sends different mixed messages. Um, but it's not to say that it can't be done. It's just one of those things that you have to be aware of. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that information. Okay, it looks like the polls closed. 93% said yes, 7% said no, and 1% said not sure what that means. Okay. Well, would the handbook explain if they what they are if they are paid when they are paid? So yeah, so employees should understand and it should be contained in their handbook that they define what their work schedules are, what days will they be working, what are their hours that they're gonna be working. So it should define when overtime begins for those non-exempt employees who would receive overtime compensation. Um, it should talk about how the employees get paid for the hours that they worked. Um, it should be clear about if there's overtime, what that process is in order for them to be approved for overtime compensation. Um, it, it, basically outlines you know what their what their work schedules are when they're and how they're going to be compensated um, it does not provide you know uh, paychecks any other day than what you've stated so if they're going to get paid bi-weekly it should state that their pay pay will be on a bi-weekly basis every other friday if that's the payday if it's the first and the 15th of the month, it should specifically state the first and the 15th of the month. If there's exceptions, if it falls on a Saturday or Sunday, that should be spelled out. If the first is on the for, on a Saturday, it would, you know, compensation will be on the Friday before. If it's a Sunday, it will be the Monday after. So each and every single specific um, situation with respect to how employees are gonna get paid should definitely be described in your employee handbook. Another thing, um, it should also include, and I think this next slide might say, kind of go into that, is you know explain you know as far as a clocking system um, when if there's any grace period. So if they clock in and they're you know if they're allowed five minutes late or before or after that they're you know, if there's a grace period, it should include there's a grace period before they're considered late um, or that they're not paid for the entire, let's just say, eight hour shift. Um, it should include if they're not at work, um, you know, what that looks like. Um, if there's a rounding method that payroll uses, um, it should describe that in the handbook. Um, it shouldn't it, it basically should give a clear understanding of how employees are going to get paid from the minute they walk in and clock in um, or uh, and to the minute that they leave. Um, off clock work, um, there should be a policy if you allow for that. Um, there is such a thing as de minimis time. So if they leave work and let's just say now they're on the phone and they're working on emails from home or they're receiving phone calls from the boss and it's excessive and routine, there might be a conversation that needs to be had as far as how that looks like and if they would get paid for that extra time that they are putting in. Um, it also should include in the handbook, aside from your work schedules and breaks and how overtime is compensated, there should be something in there that discusses um, rest and meal periods. So understand what California says when they're going to, when they are required to take a 10 minute rest period in here in California, it's, it's every four hours worked. They, or a, a fraction thereof, they should be uh, receiving a 10 minute rest period. And then also should talk about how um, meal periods are. So basically it's, uh, it should also be, you should also include in there when it is 
how long it is, and then when they're scheduled. So most people, most employers will say um, something like that they're entitled to an unpaid, uninterrupted, duty-free meal break at least 30 minutes um, after working no more than five hours. Or you could say they are going to receive this type, you could put in the same language of unpaid, uninterrupted, duty-free meal break um, for one hour after four hours work. And, and generally, somebody who works a traditional eight to five, they're taking a one hour break at, at noon. Um, so you just wanna be clear about what kind of um, break on, and meal break that they'll get and make sure that that language is in there. Um, we want to make sure that there's language in here about free speech. So a, a way that employees um, have the opportunity to come to you about whatever their concerns are. Um, we don't want employees to feel like they can't discuss any kind of complaints that they have or even, even issues with respect to their wage or salary um, terms and conditions of employment. Um, some people don't necessarily put free speech, but most employers will put something in their handbook that talks about an open door policy. So we would just want to make sure that employees don't feel banned in any way that they can't come to you as their employer to talk about these things. And yes, we would use a handbook to address some of those things, but maybe some of these things that they're bringing to your attention has to go up to another level. Um, if you have uh, unions, you know, there is also opportunity there to communicate with whoever their union representative is and understanding what those bylaws are and understanding how they have the ability to have those conversations with their representative as well. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, attendance and leaves of absences and a policy that talks about that. So we wanna make sure that based on your company size that you include any description of leaves of absences that could possibly fit the profile of the employees that you have. You wanna make sure that whoever is uh, responsible for processing leaves, that they understand how those work and how they um, integrate with other potential leaves like CIFRA or FMLA. Understand when insurance applies, when insurance is going to be terminated. Make sure they understand who's paying for that insurance benefit while they're on their leaves of absence. And you know, if, you, if you're on an accrual system for vacation, you know, make sure that there's an, an understanding of how those accruals will continue to happen or not happen. And then what the expectations are for the employee with the company while they're on a leave of absence. So depending on the kind of leave, you could put in something that says that it's expected that the employee will follow up on a monthly basis to update the employer on their, their leave of absence. Or you could say that the employer will follow up with the employee on a monthly basis to get an update of their, their leave. Um, we wanna talk about you know, company property. So if they're on a leave of absence, you know, do, are they taking any of the company property home with them? Um, I'd be really cautious of that just because if they take the equipment home, the like, they're, they're likely to work from home and therefore they're not on a leave, they're gonna have to be compensated for their time work but maybe they're a remote worker and they already have company equipment at home and they're gonna go on a leave of absence for 12 weeks, you may wanna consider having all that company property returned. Um, if you choose to leave it there, I would make sure that it's monitored to the point that, it's the, that you're able to determine that the power is off and so therefore the employee's not using the company equipment while they're on their leave of absence. The other thing that you want to make sure that your handbook covers is the return to work. So what does that look like? What are you expecting the employee to provide you? So some of the clauses that normally are expressed is that they have to provide you a doctor's note that they're able to return to work and they are released without any kind of restrictions. Um, it should also state that if they have restrictions that they have to allow you as the employer a sufficient amount of time to make sure that you could accommodate whatever those restriction are, restrictions are in order for that employee to return to work. The idea is basically when you have the employee at work, you know that they're completely fit for duty 
and you're not going to you're going to release yourselves from potentially contributing to any kind of further injury. So you just want to make sure that they're completely fit for duty and able to return to work. The next question we have is, do you have offsite employees? Yes or no? I'm gonna give it a couple seconds here. There's a lot of information going on and we've had a few questions asking if the PowerPoint will be available afterwards. And I just wanna let you guys all know that there will be a follow-up email sent with a link to access the slides. And this is also a recorded presentation, so that will be available as well. Okay, I'm going to close the polls. It looks like seven, or I'm sorry, 67% said yes, and 33% said no. Okay, that's pretty common, especially with COVID. Um, there's a lot of people that are working remotely. But some, a lot of companies also have field employees, and this is just an example of, of a possible company that has a field employee, they're construction workers. So some of the things you want to make sure when you have um, remote or outside employees, that they have um, a way to access all of the same information that your in-office staff have. So they should uh, be clear and understand, you know, how do they submit their time cards, how they clock in and out. Um, if there's commuting rules, make sure that they understand if there's carpools, what that looks like, is the employer participating, not participating. You just want to make sure um, that they have access to to everything and they're held to the same standards as your in-house employees. See, some of these other things also have to do with the legal requirement for posting. So as you all know, in, your, in a typical office, there's a bulletin board that contains information about health insurance, workers' comp insurance, the employment law poster. So field employees have to have access to those same postings. So I always suggest that there, if there's a shop or some kind of a, an area where the field employees will gather, um, that that's where those things should be. Do they have to be posted? Obviously, there's generally speaking, there's generally nothing that they could post those things to. I always say make copies of everything, minimize everything, put everything on clipboards, and just have them out. You know, whether they're off on the trucks when you first report to work. You just want to make sure that the employees have access to the information and that's really what you're legally required to do um, employees that work remotely you want to make sure that you have a policy or if, if also contained in the handbook that talks about you know who's eligible to work from home um, how many hours and how are they going to be tracking you know their hours when they're working from home and then what are the procedures for accessing um, the information remotely? What are the communication expectations? You know, are they expected to make a, you know, give a daily report? You know, some people have logs where they actually have to time keep um, uh, what they're actually doing throughout the day. Um, if those expectations are expected, make sure you communicate that, make sure you provide them the information so that you could see that, in essence, they are working at the set hours that they um, state that they're going to be working. Um, what is it that the company is going to provide them? So aside from equipment, are you providing them a stipend um, for using their own internet? Are you providing them a hotspot so that they don't use their home internet? So just specific things that you're going to provide as a company, you want to make sure that's also outlined in the handbook, as well as, you know, some kind of approval process for uh, safety and ergonomics of their workspace at home. So you could outline that they need to have a workspace um, that's, you know, set up with, and you could put the desk, a chair, and you could put the, the details of, of what's going to be, you know, acceptable to you because they are subject to and can still um, file um, workers comp claims for injury while they're working you know maybe the chair that they have you never told them what kind of chair they have so they're just using a kitchen chair and now over time they have back injuries and those sorts of things well if you have in your employee handbook the kind of chair that they're supposed to have it makes it a you have you're in a better position to dispute that claim and you also are in a position where you could possibly um, the employee could possibly face disciplinary action because it's a violation of the policy that you have provided in the handbook. 
Um, so you want to make sure also finally that you have the ability to rescind um, any kind of approval for remote work. I know more and more companies over time have been returning their employees back to work. Um, and then some employ employers are saying, you know, I don't, we have a question about how much time this person is actually working. And so therefore we want to bring the employee and they have the authority to rescind that. Um, so you want to make sure that if you, if you, you want to put yourself in a position to be able to do that, you want to make sure that you have that language as well. And then um, I always say like conduct virtual meetings periodically just to make sure that you have the ability to kind of take a look at what that work environment is like, um, making sure that they're required to turn on the video. Um, things like you want to make sure that you talk to them about um, the even dress code, you know, they, they should still be subject to dress code um, for working at home. So um, you just kind of want to talk about whatever your expectations are. You just want to make sure that you put that in your remote work um, policy. And then, you know, just don't forget the state and local laws, you know, based on their home. And that is really with respect to um, compensation and tax write-offs and things like that. So um, health and safety. So what do you include depending on the kind of um, worker they are, whether they're working remotely or in the field? You do want to talk about a health and safety section in your handbook that talks about heat illness, ergonomic expectations, smoking policies, you know, what's legally required, where can you smoke, uh, make sure you use the language um, 20 feet away from, you know, a public entrance. Um, employees who, who must drive, you know, you, if you have, you know, company vehicles or if you allow employees to use their personal vehicle for company business, make sure that they understand what that policy, um, ex what the expectations are of the policy. I always suggest make sure you cover, you know, that they're still required to follow all state laws, make sure that they, they have to abide by all traffic laws. They have to, they have to use remote uh, access for um, cell phone usage while they're driving. They are responsible for any kind of traffic violations that they receive. Should they be in an accident, what does that process look like? What are they required to do if they're in an accident or if something's stolen from their vehicle, uh, maybe company files were in the back seat. You know, make sure that there is a good understanding of the expectations and make sure it's contained in your handbook because any violation of these things, it allows you to use this handbook as a tool for, um, moving forward with some kind of discipline and then you just want to again talks about uh, referencing you know, um, any full protocols that, that you want them to follow which are some of the ones that i talked about dress code definitely should be a policy that's in your handbook but you want to make sure that there is no bias as far as um from one gender to another especially in california so you know some of the things we have to be cautious of you can't say you know, hair has to be cut short um, because, uh, you know, for, for men, you can't say that men's hair has to be short and women's hair has to be long. You have to be, make sure that everything is gender neutral. Um, you could say things for the purpose of safety, hair has to be away from your eyes or has to be pulled back. Um, same thing with uh, piercings, tattoos, all those things. You. The only focus you can have is where safety is an issue, but outside of that, you can't have one gender abide by one set of policies and the other gender not. The other thing that you want to, because it, the other thing you want to make sure that your dress code contains is specific uh, clothing that um, might be um, due to a, a religion. Some, some employees wear turbans, some have to wear long gowns. Um, some are required to only, you know, can't show certain amount parts of the body. So you just want to make sure that there is something that addresses the religious exemption and make sure that it's something that it's not going to interfere with their ability to do their job in a safe um, and efficient manner. Same thing with grooming. You could have, gen you know, just grooming policies with respect to, you know, employees should be, um, you know, exercise good, gen you know, hygiene standards. Um, we talked a little bit about tattoos and piercings. If you have uniforms, you know, you have to make sure 
that if you want your uniforms pressed, you make sure you say they should be pressed. If, if they have to be dropped off at a cleaners and picked up at a certain area, make sure you cover that. If a uniform must be worn at all times, make sure you state that. So whatever your dress code policy is, you just have to be clear um, with what that standard is. You also want to make sure that your employee handbook has certain disclaimers. Um, it's really important. Um, one of the things that I just told an employer yesterday is there has to be a, a disclaimer that states that the, the handbook is intended to be a guideline. So it's not an employee contract. Um, California laws and at will um, state, we have the right to terminate with or without cause. So just because they receive a handbook does not mean it's a contract for indefinite employment. Um, it also um, should be revised at the company's discretion. I generally say it should be looked at on an annual basis, um, but if you go a couple years, that probably will be okay. Um, sometimes on an annual basis, it's expensive and maybe it's not necessary. Maybe the law only, maybe there's only one law that has a change. So if you have, if you want to, you know, maybe save some money, you could do an addendum for that particular section of your handbook. A good example would be like your paid sick leave um, or the California sick leave law. So if it was only that section of the handbook that changed, but everything else still applies, I would just tell an employer to do an addendum for that particular section and then just get employees to sign off on that one section. Um, the other part that has um, is important is you have to include a, a notice if it's translated. Um, English version controls um, is the controlling factor, but there are uh, situations where if you have a workforce um, and if you've provided a different translation of the handbook, you need to make sure that you make note of that. Okay, let's get into our last polling question. How often do you review your employee handbook? Every year, every two years, every th three years, or it needs to be reviewed? That's a question. And just to um, reiterate, I did send an uh, uh, answer to all the attendees. We have quite a few questions and I don't know we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but we will address them individually after the presentation to, uh, via email. So if we don't get to you, if we run out of time, don't worry, we will respond. Okay, uh, looks like we've got about 65% voted. Let's wait for just a couple more seconds. And let's go ahead and close. It looks like 47% say every year, 16 every two years, 14 every three years, and 23 it needs to be reviewed. Okay. Those are pretty good results. So like I said, it is, it's definitely recommended that you review the handbook on an annual basis. It may or may not need to be modified um, in any way or revised in any way. But if there is a little bit of modification, I would I would suggest an addendum, especially if it's a, a law that change that changes what's contained in the handbook. Um, there is a requirement. We talked a little bit about translation. So if you have 10 percent or more of your employees who speak another language, then all the critical policies and that would include an employee handbook has to be translated into that language. So that would go back to um, some of the policies with respect to attendance, um, work hours, all, all of those uh, meal periods, all of those um, critical policies, sexual harassment, drug policy, all of those critical employment policies, terms and conditions of employment. If you have 10% of your employees or more that speak another language, you do need to provide them um, a, a translated version. Um, and then recognize the value versus uh, the cost of translated policy. So one of the things you want to make sure as an employer, you don't put yourself in a situation where you've got a, let's just say a, a Spanish speaking or a Hmong speaking employee who's able to do the work because they were shown and they understand a little bit of English and they're able to do the job, but then they do something that violates and then you're kind of before the court saying that, they, they didn't understand and all you could provide them is your English version. So that really doesn't put you in a good place where you're confident and, um, and you're certain that they understood what the expectations were. 
And finally, we're going to get into just signing off. So you do want to make sure that you have a signature for the entire handbook, certain clauses that say that they received and they understand, and it's their responsibility to become aware of everything contained in the handbook. You want a signature for that. Same thing if you do an addendum, you want to have a signature that they receive that addendum. You want to put those items in their employee's personnel file, or if you have an electronic system, make sure you scan that um, or docu-sign it or just something contained in their personnel record that they have that information. And then um, you don't want to have them sign in the book and then they have the handbook. Um, you also don't want them to sign um, basically their own signature. You want to make sure that you have a receipt of that in some manner. Um, training, I always suggest that you provide training when there's something new or if something's been updated, um, get another signed copy from every employee that they receive the revised version. Um, don't just distribute the handbooks and assume that the employees are going to read it. Chances are they're not. I always say in orientation, cover those most important and critical policies. There's usually about 12 to 15 that you want to make sure that you discuss in detail with the employees at, at orientation, but make sure that throughout the workday that they have an understanding and that you remind them, especially in that first introductory period, that they're expected to understand what the contents of the handbook. Um, I do say, I think I mentioned annual is preferred. Um, you could have a professional or legal review of your handbook. Um, if there's any new or upcoming laws or policies, that's you want to make sure that you go back to any and all of your documents that might reference what that item is and make sure everything is updated at the same time so that there is no misunderstanding of what the expectations are. Um, clarify Clarification based on employees' questions. So if, if you've got employees that are asking the same question on a particular policy, chances are the policy is not clear. So make sure that you get good language. Um, the, the handbook is intended to be a good resource for employees that to understand. Um, you want to make sure it's readable. It's not full of legal terminology. Um, you want to do you do want to keep your prior versions, and that's um, really just more important for reference as well as um, depending on if there's a litigation as laws change. If you know employees have the right to sue up to three years on certain cases. So if you go back to your handbook three years ago, it's a good reference for what the policy was at that time. And then don't assume that an old handbook is fine. Um, no handbook versus a bad handbook. So you want to make sure you have a good handbook. You, you want a new handbook. Um, a handbook is, is really important to have um, for all employees and for your um, company. So. I think that's it for me, unless there's any questions, and I think there's quite a bit. Yes, there's quite a bit. Thank you, that was a lot of information, and um, I think that we've had a lot of participation, but let's just get through a few that we can right now, and again, okay. we'll go, we've got a couple minutes, and then, as I said, if we can't get through anything else, we'll send emails um, individually. Okay, so the first question is, can probationary periods be used on a case-by-case -case basis for different employees? or must a company have all new employees subject to probationary periods? Um, it should, there should at least be this, it should be consistent. It should be the same. It should be uh, the same introductory period. Um, okay. They do have certain types of employment agreements that allow for like seasonal employees, temporary employees. I think those are a little bit different, but your permanent full-time employees should be subject to the same introductory or probationary period. Great. Okay, do you need to say when an annual pay rate change changes are implemented or decided? Uh, yes, there should be something in your performance evaluation or performance um, section of the handbook of how and when um, or if um, bonuses or pay changes are going to um, change. So some governmental agencies, they're on a step salary step series. And I think there's language in there that talks about if they, you know, meet overall performance and and um, standards, conduct standards, and they automatically will be, um, their salary will automatically be lifted, or upgraded 5%. Um, there are other companies that don't 
include that language because they're really, the, their salary is either based on cost of living or just at the discretion of the owner. And so it should just indicate they're still expected to perform at the standards and that their salary would be at the discretion of and may or may not be on an annual basis. You just wanna just kind of identify what that is. All right, thanks, Diana. Unfortunately, we're out of time, folks. Thank you for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send you information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, Diana, for your time and expertise today. We hope all the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. Be sure to join us on March 19th for our work comp update webinar. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, Michelle.